Distances and traffic volumes drive much more of the costs and rewards than most proponents of high-speed rail seem to realize. Looking at a timeline of the spread of dedicated high-speed rail lines around the world, there is a clear correlation between date and route length. Smaller countries with shorter distances between their high-population cities went first, while city pairs with more distance between them needed more time. In so doing, the worldwide rail industry leaned into technology choices that better suited shorter distances. This is not to say that the current gold standard of a standard gauge track with concrete slab for a base and independent overhead catenary systems per track is not technically able to span long distances, because of course it can. But the longer your distances, the more infrastructure that needs to be built and the higher the price per trip will be. Just ask the California High-Speed Rail Authority, which is attempting to build one of the longest high-speed rail lines in the world from scratch. Operating without overhead electric catenary was a major design goal for several reasons. I will speak later to the costs and limitations of catenary wires, but it is also important to consider the timing. In the 1960s, full electrification between Washington, D.C. and New York City had only just been completed 30 years earlier, and because that was among the first major mainline electrification projects in the world, some important and expensive lessons had to be learned in the process. Industry leaders were desperate to find a way around the need for this expensive upgrade, and the continued technical issues of the Metroliners, happening at the same time, only reinforced this need. And for the commenters who seem to think that this is a uniquely American attitude, it certainly was not. Rail operators around the world continued to experiment for many years with alternative fuels and engine types, including the famous French TGV, which in its initial form was anticipated to use gas turbine engines, similar to the American turbotrain. Oil was cheap, and in the early 1970s, it seemed like everything was going the way of the jet and the turbine. But, of course, these assumptions would not last. Obviously, the oil crisis of the late 1970s proved that a reliance on oil would make everything vulnerable to price hikes and general uncertainty. But a bigger issue for American railroads turned out to be speed limits, since very few locations were actually ready for 170 mph operations, even without the need for electric catenary. <laughs> 